encryption just hope that you enjoy this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome back to an episode of the Time Shifters Podcast. This is Christopher here with Tom. Tom, how the heck are you? I am pretty well. Yes. Good. Yes. Glad to hear it. I wanted to mention to everyone, I am trying to kind of build up our Discord channel a little bit. I'm doing a little bit of work over there, giving us a, a, a few more topics to discuss, and I'm just trying to get the word out that you know, maybe you didn't know we hit a Discord channel or anything. Uh, see if I can get some more people out there to uh, to join, and so we can have some fun and some conversations and stuff. I think it would be a it'd be nice to have some more people share the things they're watching and share their thoughts and some of the news that comes out and you know genre related stuff. So anyway, follow the link in the show notes. You'll find the link to the Discord channel there. Uh, I think you can just go to Discord and search for the Time Shifter. No, nope, just follow the link. That's the easiest way to do it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got two podcasts g- kind of going on there, so it's a, it's a little hard just to just search and find the, the thing. So you follow, follow the links best. Maybe I'll end, actually open a Discord account then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. As I was last episode, I mentioned that I was going to be guesting on Good Movie, Bad yes. Movie. Let everybody know I'm going to be guesting on it one more time. And uh, this time we're going to be talking about 1998's Godzilla. His favorite, folks. Oh, <laughs> his absolute 1,000 percent favorite Godzilla ever. I have to watch it this week. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> Should I send you my Taco Bell dog? <laughs> no, no. I think it's going to be a fun discussion. I'm going to have a good time talking about it. I'm going to have a good time talking about it with two people that at least one person has seen it. One person has probably not seen it. I'm really curious to see her opinion or hear her opinion on it. So, yeah, that should be a fun one. So keep an eye out for that episode. I know I'm going to listen to that one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So what you been up to lately there, Tom? Ah, uh, did a little traveling, been to Boston, ate way too much food, all, all that one. Easy to do in yeah. Boston. That is the, I've been there for, I was there for a week for some training years ago. And I, I think I'm still full <laughs> from that well, trip. And when, when, when actually catered to, because uh, it was for a conference, so no money output by me, uh, we one of the things we got to do was eat at a very fancy seafood restaurant that served us nonstop. And like, I actually kind of left there not feeling well because I had overconsumed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I went on the company credit card as Ooh, well. So all way. the food was on. So all the food was on someone else's dime. And yes, we ate at several seafood restaurants. We ate at many Italian restaurants. We ate so well while we were there. I think we, we both at one point sat down and just had, we'll have the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was just how elaborate this was, too. They, they, it was sort of family style, and everyone still got a full half lobster. <laughs> On yes, top of nice. all the other dishes that were being served. It was like insane. Yes, delicious, delicious food from that part of the mm-hmm. country. Have you had a, much of a chance to watch anything despite your trip? Uh, despite that, I uh, actually came back from the trip uh, and had a very wonderful lazy weekend last weekend and found myself trying out a Netflix series that is just gone into its second season called The Tourist. There are no actors in it that I know of on site. Like, uh, they're, they're not familiar to me. So this is a fairly new cast of, uh, of actors and characters. And the premise is really kind of... I don't know. It, it, it sounds like something that would have come maybe 30 years ago, but they've done so well with it. This is an amnesia case. 
the notion is that our our our, our lead in this is um, is a guy that you have a hard time getting a read on because we enter him in the middle of some action that caught leads him to a to a car accident and he's not been the sweetest of guys in even the like five to ten minutes we get that opening sequence but after the car accident his he's lost all sense of self doesn't know his name doesn't know anything and then activities ensue and the way that it's done it's all set in australia in the outback um he's irish though um there's a a beat cop who um who who is a little heavier set and is having a relationship with her impending uh marriage uh so she's dealing with her fiance her weight the fact that she's a cop stuck in a thing where she's acting as a detective but isn't one i'm kind of just like all over the map with this but i can't tell you how many of these little pieces all come together and make for a really interesting story it's intense and, and it's got enough action in it to to lead you along but the acting is just so good yeah. Nice. Oh, very cool. So you'd been actually watching something of quality. <laughs> yes, surprisingly so. I take it uh, you have not. <laughs> well, it depends on your point of view. Uh, my mother and father-in-law, we were over at their house at, at, for dinner not that long ago, and I, I don't know, remember how it came up in conversation, but I mentioned that I never really watched any of the old W.C. Fields movies. Oh, okay. So for my recent birthday, they bought me a, uh, a DVD with a 10-pack of uh, W.C. Fields movies on them. And my wife and I have been sitting down and burning through these things. And uh, some of them have been a heck of a lot of fun. And others will both go, eh, there's a few chuckles, but this would have been better if W.C. Fields had <laughs> <laughs> well, he did have a very uh, to-type uh, thing that he would do. His comedy was very specific. Yeah, well, we're seeing it, you know, because these films start out, like, in the uh, mid-30s, I guess, early to mid-30s. Mm -hmm. And then we're up into some films that are taking place in the 40s, and there's a definite little shift in his acting. Yeah. And his type of acting, so it's interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, outside of that, and more genre related and everything, um, I listened to another podcast and they mentioned this film, and it just got me in the hankering to watch it. Yeah, I watched 1982's Megaforce. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good movie. No. <laughs> And uh, I posted about it on social media, and I was getting my ass handed to me by a lot of people who disagree. <laughs> they think that is, I think a lot of people believe that that is a so bad it's good movie. I I don't know if I can agree. I just, I don't think that movie's, it's not good. <laughs> well, no, I don't remember it as it having been good. Uh it, it, it's rife for making fun of it. Yes, absolutely. In fact, didn't not necessarily Mystery Science. Well, maybe did Mystery Science Theater do this one? If they did it in one of the latter iterations, uh, you know, one of the Netflix or the the streaming yeah. ones, maybe I don't. I don't know. I I, I can't say for certain, but it has all of that. <laughs> It's just riddled with goodness for tearing it apart, but but it is a teardown. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> if Riff Tracks hasn't done it, I'd be surprised. Yeah. Uh, I watched a film from 1990 called The Rift. Okay. And it felt really 80s. <laughs> and it took me three nights to finish it because I kept falling asleep. Take that as you will. <laughs> The mark of quality. Yeah, it was uh, lots of toy submarines and some so-so creature effects <laughs> and bad acting is pretty much what that could sum up that film. 
uh, featuring Ray Wise. Yeah, Ray <laughs> Wise and uh, Jack. What's his name? Jack Scalia is the star. Yeah, yeah, Scalia. Scalia. Yeah, he yeah, has the most um, fantastic sort of like. 1980s MTV feathered hair <laughs> in that film. <laughs> and I think that's what I, I kept watching it waft around and I think that's what was making me doze off. I mean, it is from 1990, so it is bare, it was all shot in the 80s. Uh, good point. <laughs> yeah, it, no one flipped the switch at 1990 and said, bling, you're now cooler than the 80s. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yeah, you have no idea. I have no idea when this thing was actually filmed. It may have taken years to find distribution, so this could have been smack dab in the 80s. Started in 84. (laughs) (laughs) Another film I watched just recently, this one took me a couple nights to watch only because it's two hours long, and I just kept starting it a little late. Yeah. It was called Last Sentinel from 2023. Okay. I liked 99% of that film. Okay. There's about five minutes towards the end of the film that I think if those five minutes weren't there and you just tweaked the ending a little bit, this would have been a really great watch. Someone decided, oh, we need some sort of twist. If they had asked me, I would have went, no, 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 you don't. (laughs) Don't, no, no well, twisting. You have me intrigued. I don't actually know this one, so it, it was. You know, the acting was was good. It was atmospheric. Uh, it takes place sometime in the future, where the the oceans have all risen. There's very little land left. There's like two sort of warring nations, at a and having a, effectively a cold war, and yeah. these three people are stationed on this. This, this, this base in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And the only reason they're there is because one side can't get to the other without them seeing them first. That's why they're there. Yeah. And they have on board this station a thermonuclear device that if they need to, they can set it off and, you know, right. destroy the Wipe enemy. out everything in the nearby area. Yes. But there is actually hints, too, that the idea that because of everything that's gone on with the planet, the, the, the axis has shifted and everything, that this device could potentially destroy the world. Oh, nice. And so there's that sort of thing shadowing everything else that takes place and goes on aboard this ship or aboard this station. Uh, I said three. Yeah. There's four people. Excuse me. Yeah, I really dug so much of it. I mean, I was like kind of edge of the seat, kind of, it was just very drama and story heavy. And it was really pulling me in great set pieces, you know, well shot. And it's yep. just that last little bit of story that I just went, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that does sound disappointing, but I might have to check this out just to see, Get get the effect for myself. Yeah, it's on Prime, which is how I stumbled across it. It was one of these things that just popping up in the you might like, and I kept kind of skipping over, probably just because of the length, because um, I'm always yeah. looking for something that I can watch just before it gets too late. Yeah. And this one, I decided, well, I'll, I'll start it and see how far I get. And yeah, I wanted, I I was watching the whole thing and I wanted to finish it, but it was just I couldn't, and so I was really eager to finish it the next day. And, you know, that doesn't always happen. So that gives you some indication of, like, how I was kind of into this film. But, uh, yeah, it's just, mm, just that those few minutes. I was like, (laughs) oh, that's just, darn it. (laughs) You went from me giving you, like, a seven or eight to maybe get a five. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. That's actually quite the plummet for that. (laughs) For a couple of minutes, a story that you could have done without. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to tempt you with one fun little piece, and we can let this uh, infiltrate the brains of everybody sure. out there. 
due to the weather and all that, while it was cold or, or wet or whatever, we'd start doing our runs uh, to stay in shape as much as us old folks can stay in shape. Um, so we've been get, making our running time pass by watching um, the old G.I. Joe cartoon series. Nice. Which, which is always a, a, a riot to catch again because I mean it's just Cobra and G.I. Joe is just a laughable kind of combination and the fact that they just keep doing it over and over uh-huh. again <laughs> but um, we always have conversations as we're as we're exercising and taking in our G.I. Joe about how ridiculous one thing is or another but after watching the last one and watching Cobra fail once again with some elaborate plan where they've already got enough money that they've built this elaborate underwater city. <laughs> right. Uh, but they're still worried about taking over the rest of the world. But I challenged my friend uh, with, with this thought after watching uh, Cobra fail so often and all that. I challenge anyone that was ever into this as a kid that cobra commander actually is a genius because he always screwed up and he always found an elaborate way to screw up but i've been thinking what would he do if he actually took over the world like (laughs) it's the old adage does the dog know what he'd do with the car if he caught it Mm -hmm. (laughs) so would Cobra Commander know what to do with the world if he actually had it to rule? <laughs> no. That's a no. really no, great... No, the answer to that is a thousand percent no. <laughs> but I now dare you to think about ruling the world was never the goal. It's the chase. Yeah. He goes through all of this So that G.I. Joe will hunt him down and he wants to get them close enough that he can still get away. And and all of his top folks will get away, which of course plays into the whole 80s thing. And they were never going to catch each other 100%. Um, We'll capture one of you for a while, but you're never going to stay. So that is the goal. It's the thrill of getting G.I. Joe to hunt him down and foil his plan and I think he'd actually be deeply disappointed if one of his really elaborate plans actually worked. <laughs> you know, now I just want to see an episode where, like, Cobra goes off to try to do something and G.I. Joe goes, yeah, I'm just going to sit this one out. But, but, yeah. you must fight me! No, yeah, exactly. we're good. <laughs> <laughs> the game's on. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd love to get the... Not that they would have ever written it and that it was never the point, but yeah, the, the I want the whole, what happens if it either goes his way? Yeah, there's there's <laughs> Destro by him. Oh, then finally we have our chance to, uh, for, and, and Cobra Commander's like, ah, uh, forget it. <laughs> and, and, and it's hard, and granted, uh, things like um, um, Austin Powers came out of stuff like this anyways, so... Especially the Dr. Evil character with the megalomaniac kind of thing, but never competent enough to do anything about it. Screams Cobra Commander all over the place. But yeah, <laughs> but after having been around long enough to absorb all the Austin Power stuff, watching the Cobra Commander stuff, it's hard not to go start looking at him as Dr. Evil and Destro a, a, as number two. Because <laughs> Destro could probably convince him, you know, we actually already make it ton of money yeah i mean can't we just my, buy a politician or two <laughs> my legitimate company that makes weapons actually rakes in so much but it does beg the question why are you with cobra commander yes but, but anyway we have been having a lot of fun with the philosophical <laughs> conversations around that is what's brilliant. actually happening that is hilarious no i love the idea i yeah i just I want to see a cartoon now, just, you know, like a spoof cartoon where it's like, Uh, you know, five years post Cobra Commander. And he's just there like, I I don't know. Everyone should wear blue today. (laughs) You're in red. 
throw him into prison. You know, feed him. Make him battle a, a robotic scorpion that we have <laughs> built for no apparent reason. Right. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, that cartoon. Yeah. I, that is so funny. You're going back and visiting that. Got that cartoon. Definitely. I mean, it was. It's a toy commercial that was also hamstrung by the sort of uh, cartoon morality police of the time. Yeah. That everything had to have a, a moral lesson. And then, of course, you had to have everyone jump out just in time before their vehicle exploded and parachute to safety and all. No, because uh, we actually achieved the, we watched the controversial episodes. Uh, there was a two-parter where we actually saw dead Joes. Oh, do we? Yes. It went, you had to go into an alternate universe to do it. Oh, but, but yes, there there was there was an alternate universe where Cobra won, GI Joe lost, uh, and at one point we actually see uh, three bodies, uh, and they happen to belong to the same Joes that are looking at the three bodies. Oh, interesting! Oh, I vaguely so remember it, that. Yeah, no, uh, it, it's one that'll jog your memory once you get going, but. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was the controversial one because while you didn't see anything happen, it was suggested that they were they were dead, and named characters were also the ones that were dead. So that was that was a kind of a an extra little dig. But actually, that's the funny thing. Not that we need to get into all that, but those cartoons at those times were also the ones that still found ways to challenge topics that you wouldn't have thought to brought up like to this day my first experience with death is optimus prime dying in the movie oh yeah for the transformers movie Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so when you take your favorite character in the world at the time (laughs) and you actually murder him on the screen and that's like okay (laughs) but he's he's coming back right (laughs) only for the monetary value but that didn't save all those other Poor Autobots that died. No, absolutely not. Sorry, Tom. I know it's still. <laughs> it's all right. It's a touchy subject. All right. Well, go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast, and then when we get back, we're going to take a look at 2010's Repo Men. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how much of that movie you just saw actually happened? My name is Dan Lefebvre, and I'm the host of Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares Hollywood with history. On each episode, we'll tackle a different movie or TV show that claims to be based on a true story and separate fact from fiction. So when you're ready to learn how much actually happened, search for Based on a True Story in your favorite podcast app of choice or find it over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. It's compact, it's safe, it's comfortable. Everything you want in a new liver. The price, $756,000. Let me just reassure you that our credit department will find a plan that fits your lifestyle. He'll sign it. Everybody signs it. But what they don't tell you is if you can't pay the bills, some union man will break into your house and reclaim our property. I can pay. Sorry, that's not my department. Live up. What are you, hanging out at AA meetings? We got a time bomb. My name's Remy. That's my best friend, Jake. We grew up together, and now we work together. Yeah, job's a job. What do you think keeps a world together? It's rules. It's people abiding by the terms of the deals that they sign themselves. How's your pancreas holding up? <laughs> I sent the money in this morning. <laughs> <laughs> We're always going to be repo. From the IRS? Nah. Are they going to give me a new art? No. Nah. No, your credit history. You're a very lucky man, you know that? What you're looking at here is the new heart module, top of the line. Get it out. No time at all, you're gonna be back on your game. You're gonna be knocking them back. 
You've done this a thousand times. What is wrong with you? Falling behind on payments. Your repo. They'll come for you too. Who do you think Frank's gonna send after me? Maybe me. Wherever we go, wherever we hide, they'll find us. What do you want to do? Finish this. Take me out of the system. Give me your heart. Or we could come up with a plan that fits your... Uh... Now he's yours. End it, Jake. Now. I'm not letting you go. I can't go back. Repo Man. Directed by Miguel Sapochnik and stars Jude Law, Forrest Whitaker, Liv Schreiber, and Alice Braga. In the year 2025, medical technology has made it possible to replace nearly every organ in the human body for a price. A corporation called The Union offers some fantastic payment plans, but if you can't pay, they insist their product is returned. Jude Law's Remy, a repo man working for The Union, one of the best at his job of finding and forcibly repossessing the parts. When a work-related accident leaves him with an artificial heart, he suddenly finds himself seeing the other side of the coin. Finding it difficult to murder people for their organs, he falls behind on the payments. Now on the run from the company he once worked for, including his partner, Jake, uh, played by Forrest Whitaker, Remy dives deep into the underworld of debtors and black market organs to try and save his life and expose the truth about the hard sell tactics of the union. This was based on the 2009 novel Repossession Mambo by Eric Garcia, uh, with a screenplay written by Garcia and Garrett Lerner. The underlying premise is very similar to the 2002 stage opera and the 2008 film Repo, the Genetic Opera. Not anything of significance there, but I thought I would bring it up. <laughs> I think sure. I read that somewhere and like, oh, yeah, I forgot about well, it. The it, title of the book shows up in the movie. <laughs> in this movie, it does. Yes. In it, this movie. This was a first time watch for me. Have you watched this one before? I actually have. In fact, I believe I saw this one in the theater. Oh, OK. Wow. So you saw this back in 2010 when it came out. Yep. I was actually going into this thinking that maybe I had seen it. There is, and, yeah. and I think maybe what it was is the, the the trailer. I think I must have seen the trailer and thought, oh, I think I'll, I'll, I'd like to catch that sometime, and I never did. Hmm. Okay. Maybe because if I remember reading right, it kind of came and left the theater rather quickly. I couldn't say for sure. I, I would have known that I went uh, because I was kind of on a Jude Law kick because mm. uh, I was enjoying seeing him in uh, various films. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the film here. The budget for the film was around $32 million, and apparently the box office was only 18.4. Mm. So I could see this one maybe not doing so hot at opening weekend and uh, something else coming along pretty easily knocking it out. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what would have been running against it at the time. And March is already not one of your premier times to release your big names. And we watch this because it uh, supposedly takes place in 2025, which is only 15 years from the time of the film's release. Right. They paint a very futuristic world for setting it only 15 years in the future. They do, although there, there was still some balance in there. Things like weapons and vehicles weren't any more sophisticated than they are now. No, that's true. But you still had the, uh, you know, the suspended monorails, and and the idea of the uh, the artificial organs advancing as much as they did in this time was maybe a little bit of a a, a fantasy. Uh, especially since they've gone um, this in order for this particular version of things to work, uh, they had to be mechanical. Mm -hmm. Not that we wouldn't necessarily do, but there's been far more direction in trying to recreate organic organs rather than build mechanical ones. Right. 
Yeah, you're mentioning uh, uh, Jude Law, and mm-hmm. that was kind of your uh, your your entry point uh, into the film. I do like Jude Law. He's done some interesting films, and he's like one of these actors where I don't go out and like search of Jude Law films, but when I find him in films, I tend to really like him in him, in them. Yeah, and, and while I say that I'm. I, I enjoy and probably went to see it because he was in it. He does have that kind of presence that's kind of like, like, I don't know that I see that I'm actively seeking him out. It was kind of like, oh, this was an interesting premise. Oh, and it has Jude Law. I like Jude Law. So, but I don't think of him right away on things. But but yeah, the more that I see him in stuff, I, I, I just, he is a draw. Yeah, I believe one of the first films that I really noticed him was, wasn't he uh, in Gattaca? He was the guy that uh, Ethan Hawke sort of um, takes his place of. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a minor role, but an important role in that film. And I, it, it, the strangest thing is like I, I saw that film. I know it stars Ethan Hawke and everything, but my brain kind of immediately went to, when I thought of Jude Law, it immediately went to something like Gattaca. And I don't know why. Where he came to mind for me uh, was, uh, I saw the talented Mr. Ripley and and AI. Yeah. yeah. um, And his role in AI was a lot of fun and and the way that he did it. And then ultimately it's still, haven't watched it in a while. It's got me thinking about it again. But uh, Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow. Thank you. I I have a soft spot in my heart for that film. Yeah, I mean the the, the noir feel, the Art Deco, everything. Um, the fact that it's not to say that it's not in color is not accurate, but everything's sepia toned to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. Um, washing away all other colors so yeah it's just so much fun and i loved him in it i think it's another thing i like about him is he doesn't seem to be one of those actors that is going to necessarily turn down a role because he thinks it's beneath him if that role looks like it's going to be fun or going to be interesting so he'll do stuff that's kind of a kid's film or He'll do voice work for a kid's film, or he'll appear in something like uh, Fantastic Beasts here recently in 2018, but then, or something like Sky Captain. But yes, he's in something like The Talented Mr. Ripley or uh, I Heart Huckabee. He, he does interesting things. Yes. No, I, and uh, I, I'm just now seeing that. He was uh, Dr. Watson uh, literally the year before he did Repo Men. So, um, and I, I, that, that version of Sherlock Holmes uh, is actually one of my favorites. I like that rather quite a bit. Yeah, excellent. I haven't seen that one. I'll have to check that yeah. one out. Robert Downey Jr. as the unlikely uh, actor to portray <laughs> Sherlock, Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, but he. He actually pulls off a fairly impressive uh, British accent, and he just wears the part really well. And with Jude Law playing off of him, you really did kind of get this sense of uh, you take away all the old dusty kind of versions of Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. and, and it, it becomes a buddy picture, <laughs> and, nice. and very much so. And it's so much fun. Yeah, awesome. So, so if you haven't caught that already, you need to get to that one. Yeah, no, it's always been, it, again, you know, on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen the list. <laughs> yeah, the ever great. My list, it, it looks like a receipt from uh, CVS. Yes. <laughs> I guess uh, Forrest, Forrest Whitaker, we can talk about a little bit here. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, he's another actor where he takes on some eclectic roles. Yes. And that's, maybe that's kind of one of the things, but this film has a strength in it. It is that it's got actors that are willing to just be those kind of actors where it's like, it's not just like that thing you just saw them in. They're going right. to be different in this. Yeah, it shakes it up. And, and, and here, not not to bury the lead, I enjoy Repo Man. It, it's not a great film. <laughs> but... 
because it has this level of acting in it, Jude Law, Forrest Whitaker, Alice Braga, Leif Schreiber, I mean, they elevate this thing enough that even though there are lots of problematic parts, you're like, I still kind of enjoy watching them do it. It's like... It's like somebody said, okay, you're all fantastic actors. Let's do something kind of silly, but we're not sure if we're going to make it silly. Right. Like, like it's it's like full drama that's not taking itself entirely seriously. And, and it's, it doesn't sit right, but you can enjoy watching it. It has the feel and the story. It has the, the elements of a film that you would see at, on a like sci-fi original back in the mm-hmm. early 2000s. But it's got an incredible cast. And maybe that's why it didn't do too well at the box office. Is it's just it couldn't find its uh it couldn't find its audience. Is this is this a B movie or is are they shooting for an Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there was a lot of Oscar talent right there. So. Yeah. That's a fair explanation and one of the things about this film that is part of the problematic is the world seems to revolve around this company, uh, the union and their medical parts. Like it, like we get to a sequence where they're trying to get away and they're trying to go through the airport Mm -hmm. and the airport is even scanning for whether or not you have mechanical body parts. Um, you know, like, when did the world's economy all become about harvesting people's organs? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's that's definitely something that I that I picked up as well. Is this everything in this film relies so heavily on this one aspect of society? Yeah, definitely. And I guess you know the story doesn't work unless it does. But yeah, it does beg the question: Why? Not getting into the reviews, because actually I'm not even going to re- re- read from this one review, but one of them made a, a, an interesting point is this movie uh, makes a, a a big case for a single payer health care program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because if this thing actually existed, and I think that's part of what takes you out of this uh, a little bit, is um, the, the premise itself is ridiculous to a point where you're like okay you guys are presenting it kind of fun and i get what you're trying to say but none of this would ever ever happen (laughs) no this is the kind of thing that would happen this this would be a story about the filthy rich and famous this would be Mm -hmm. more you know um we had the same problem with uh with the bruce willis film Surrogates. Surrogates. Thank you. I was. Yes. I was. I, I was grasping for the name. You know, the one with the surrogates. <laughs> yeah. The the idea that you know this is definitely technology and an advantage that the rich and famous would have, sure, and not the average Joe. But in this world, everyone has an opportunity for it. Well, and, and you get the impression, uh, especially with how many... I uh, Granted, we're following the repo men, but I mean, even when we're out in more public areas, everybody's had an organ replaced. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened in the world that all these organ failures are happening, which, which could then get into a way better <laughs> storyline, is that the union has, is self-reinforcing. Yeah. Um, well, and not just organs, because we also see uh, Alice Braga's character. She's got a, an artificial knee. Yep. And that is enough. Uh, apparently, she didn't pay for it. And <laughs> so that's enough to, to get her repoed. Okay, so these things cost what they cost. So, yeah, you could have set up the class kind of warfare thing, but we're selling this to everybody. Yeah. Um. To everybody that has no means to pay for any of this stuff. Uh, Like, I think one of the ones that they talked about specifically was $312,000. And it was like just the kidney or something like that. I don't remember which organ they were quoting. But clearly out of most people's price range for a medical procedure of any kind that you're going to pay out of pocket. Because none of this is insured. 
Uh, so then you'd live in the same world where it's okay for people to run out and butcher human beings to get the property back? How did that survive? I like to even think the current Congress might not let that one slip by. This film, I mean, it came out in 2010, and the way that they were, they showed the sales about, oh, yeah, it's 312000 but it's for your family. And, yes. and it's got, you you know, if you fall a little behind, this has got a, a three-month cushion, and, you know, mm. they're, they're selling us and everything. You really could um, use this film as sort of an analogy to the... Uh, just a few years prior when you had the, the housing crisis, when the big mm. housing bubble burst, where people, banks were giving junk loans to people they knew wouldn't be able to pay back for these homes, but they were giving yeah. them the loans. Yeah, you can see a little bit of similarity there. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You can It's just, uh, at least if you lost your house, you didn't necessarily get gutted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, because I mean, it, yeah, even in this world, the notion that they'll go out there, nobody is stopping them from butchering human beings to get get a part out. It's not like they're being chased. In fact, the way the movie kind of makes it go is there. there's almost a prestige level to being a repo man. You're not liked, but you're respected. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but you've got a license to kill. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and that that's the part that they didn't. I don't know. I needed something. I needed something to explain. How did this get to be all okay? Yeah. <laughs> How did this fit snugly into our society? I, I, and you didn't project it far enough out that something horribly radical would have really done us in. So, yeah. I, so the whole premise, as much as you're trying to have the fun with it, it starts to go, it just keeps itching in the back of your brain. Like none of this, none of this would happen at all, ever. Another piece of the story that has to happen in order for the story to continue, but is another one of those things that you ask why. Yeah. Uh, Rennie is, is, is hurt in a quote unquote accident. Mm -hmm. And the, the union just puts a new heart in him. Right. Yeah, it uh, ruined your heart. We gave you a new one. You can pay us back. Wait, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was was this in his contract that if he was harmed in the line of duty or something that they were just going to, you know, replace whatever it needed to and you'd have to pay it back? How, how does this work? Is that you go and like put this thing in me without my permission and I have to pay for it? <laughs> yeah. I, it, it just would have been nice if there had been just a line from uh, from Leif Schreiber just say something like, hey, you know, and per your contract or something, we, anything, just some little bit of legalese mentioned somewhere. Sure. Him question like, why would you, why would you do this? I can't afford this. And like, well, per your contract and the line, we have the right because you're a, you're an asset to the company, anything. I'm going to use that particular peculiarity to, to launch into the other one where and we weren't going to get away from talking about this, their quote unquote twist um, where they introduce total recall into the <laughs> middle, into the middle of their movie, which they did dig in a little ad for this device thing. The M what was yeah, it, the they, M5. They, they set it up somewhere in the film as just sort of an aside yeah so that we can get to a thing where now we make a uh, a dreamlike scenario uh that our hero is now going down so theoretically he's actually been caught but the entire last third of the movie is all him dreaming uh essentially what he would have liked to have seen happen but even in that, there's some flaws because uh, I remember distinctly when that part engages, he walked away from having killed his friend who then shows up later and helps him out. And that does not warp him instantly. They're in the middle of a fight. That's when the transition takes place. And now we're on the dream path for the rest of the movie until they let you in on, on the secret at the end. Right. But... He he has actually knifed his friend in the middle of that fight. 
Yeah, I don't know if he necessarily knew that he... Well, he obviously didn't. I, I don't think there was any... He, he had any impression that he killed him, because I think um, uh, Braga's character turns up and says, oh, I, I was able to stun him. Yeah, maybe... I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something, but the, the, the middle when they're hot and heavy in the fight and when we switch to the dream, dream sequence and he's walking away and he sees his friend lying face down on the grate... I got the impression he was dead. Mm, yeah, um, no, I don't. But I, then he shows up, and, and not, and even if he wasn't dead, he shows up later, completely unharmed. Right, and everyone's fine with everybody. Everyone's friends. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, it's a little weird there. And then it launches into that uh, that. I don't know, necro erotica sequence <laughs> at the end as they're trying to to uh, repo their own uh, organs yeah, into the yeah. system. <laughs> See, that and a lot that happens just prior to that, yeah. it works and makes sense because you realize that it's all fantasy. It's all a, a dream world. It would work anyway if we hadn't just watched a lot of, and I'm talking about like some of the, the, the fight scenes and yeah. you know the ability that these guys have to overcome any obstacle yeah. All that seems plausible when you're thinking, oh, it's all in a neural network. It's all fantasy. If we hadn't spent the first half of the film seeing the exact same thing, which was supposedly in reality. Right. <laughs> Even taking in all of that into account, then you have to deal with the, okay, we have just built this entire world that revolves around this one company raking in the dough by by selling people things that they can't afford and then taking it back and then selling it to the next guy. That's part of why they repo them. They're going to get they're going to put them back out there. So why hook up the guy to who will never pay for anything cuz at this point he's a vegetable. Um, why hook him up to the computer to make him feel good about everything? That Jake is the one that says that he's going to pay for it all. His his buddy, his friend oh, still okay, then. you know the one that in his own weird way was trying to help him. You know, he was trying right. to force him into murdering some people because that was going to help him. That was going to save his life. So it's Jake that was paying for this. Okay. Okay. Then you're filling in at least one gap. Yeah. I, I retract that. Yeah. That is, that was in there. He's paid off the guy's heart. He's, you know, picked up the payments. He's the one that's arranged for this neural network thing. So yeah. it's it's all Jake. Jake is the quote unquote hero of the film. <laughs> if it weren't for that whole damn near killing him the first time, so he'd be in this situation. Right. Yes. What a weird motivation that is. Yes. I I did that so you wouldn't leave the job. You'd have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> in which case him paying for this neural thing uh i don't know maybe some sort of weird atonement but because of the the way that this this movie tracks and the fact that it wants to take more of its action um sequences more seriously than actually trying to build on the story see that could have landed better if it was more of a person-centric kind of a story rather than an action Good explanation still kind of doesn't sit right. <laughs> no, I, there's a lot within this story that doesn't. It's interesting ideas, and it would work if this was a different film. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's him trying to save his marriage until he meets Alice Braga, and then out of hell with that. <laughs> I think I'll just hook up with her. <laughs> yeah, I think we're getting to the point where. It centered around this one premise a little too hard and then tried to incorporate too many other stories that never come together. They, that You don't get satisfaction out of any of them. No, no, exactly. Sat down and had my phone out ready to make uh, some notes and stuff about what did they get right and what yeah. did they get wrong. And they got nothing right as far as I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and because it wasn't far enough out, the stuff that they got right was basically leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they had smart cars, except I think their smart car was all electric. Uh, hey, we got a whole year to go. So. <laughs> That's true. Who knows what will come out? Get on a, a Mercedes or BMW or whoever the hell owns those. <laughs> 
Well, actually, they were driving around in Volkswagen Tiguans. <laughs> yeah. That was actually it, probably the coolest looking Volkswagen I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Grand. They bolted on a couple of extra pieces to make it look a little more beefy. Yes. But, yeah, that, yes. Absolutely. I read somewhere that uh, Volkswagen allowed them to use the cars. They would uh, they would give them some uh, some sponsorship money or whatever, but yeah. the cars had to be visible for like X amount of time. So that's why we get so many like little beauty shots of the car driving down the road and stuff. <laughs> oh no, it sticks out like a commercial. <laughs> that. That VW logo on the front of that thing is shiny all the time. <laughs> yeah, don't you love that one? Like the entire car is like painted matte, as like it's like it like it's gonna blend into the dark, except mm-hmm. for those logos. <laughs> yeah, except for those logos that stand out a mile away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't have any notes about any any technology. There is some cool stuff. I like their little stunner pistols. I thought those were clever. Those were pretty those cool, were. handy. Yeah, outside of that, I I I got nothing, and I posted it to social media and didn't get any comments. So my little uh, section is very brief. Well, and, and well, the only thing I picked up on that they they made a point to show a couple of times is their um, their little uh, sealant foam system for mm. stitching a, up uh, that. I thought that was interesting. I we don't have anything quite like that yet. No. I mean, there is liquid skin, but it doesn't work like that. No, no. <laughs> So I thought that was, and I think that's what was kind of weird. I mean, yeah, they they had these me- mechanical organs and all that, but given the medical nature of all of this, they did hack job kind of stuff out in the field anyways. I mean, literally the guy was using a, a chef's knife at one point to cut the guy's kidney out. I'm like, so... Yeah, they, they they missed an opportunity to maybe be a little more cool on the on the medical side. It would have worked more in this universe had the uh, the repo men act more like a police force mm. that would go and like capture and take them to a a, a repossession hospital or something yes. like that. Yeah, because that's part of what I, I get the I get the action and the intensity of the, somebody literally tearing one of your organs out, no matter where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so the visceralness of it is what they're going for, but it just doesn't make sense. It, it, that's the part that starts rubbing up against that. Would society really let people just hunt other people? Right for. For a metal yeah, I, I think they were definitely leaning into the idea of the repo man that, you know, when they mm-hmm. come to get your car because you missed a payment or something like that, they come and they, they throw it on a tow truck and they go. You know, they, yeah. they'll they come in at midnight, they'll come at, you know, 2 a.m., whatever it takes to get that car, that's what they're going to do. They'll, they'll cut the lock off your gate, whatever they need to do in order to get that car. And I think they were really leaning heavy into that. Yes. But this world and the idea of the repossessing the organs, there would still be something kind of dark and kind of fun about the idea of like, you know, the, the precinct, <laughs> this, <Yes. laughs> this police precinct uh, where this would go and, and happen. And, you know, you'd get one phone call to tell your family, like, I'll be late for dinner. I, I, I missed my payment on my liver. You know, I, <laughs> That yeah, could have no, that could have worked too. Yeah, you could could have done it in a couple of different ways, but yeah. Uh, again, thinking about the the economic circumstances of this world, even the notion that uh, people know that repo men are a thing, that they're going to come for you. So selling that gear must be really damn hard because. That's what's literally in the back of everybody's head is if I don't do this, somebody's going to just literally tear it out of me. I, I wanted a little exploration. They're, they're taking these things back and putting them supposedly maybe going to reuse them or whatever. Mm-hmm. Where's the aftermarket uh, business? 
you know, so you got the union who sells it brand new, but you know, is there that, uh, can you go online and go, Oh, but you can get a refurbished for at, at 75% the cost. Well, while not quite the legitimate path, that was the John Leguizamo character. He was busy taking anything they harvested from anywhere else. So at which he made the point, I'm at least taking them out of people that die. Right. Um, yeah, so but he was collecting them and doing his own uh, backroom. Yeah, that was <clears throat> black, secondhand. That was you know kind of black market sort of thing. Yes. But I, I, there would also be a legitimate uh, business selling the the refurbished parts. <laughs> let's let's reopen up this world and introduce. Uh, let's eliminate the monopoly. Let's get some competition in there where. Some of them actually advertise, our repo men are friendly and nice, and they're actually going to bring you in here, and you're going to live the next day. You might be in a little medical trouble because you still need that part, Yeah, you're going to live till you can't. We'll make sure that we have a full medical staff on hand. Yes. <laughs> to prolong your life until either you can get extended credit or... <laughs> yes, or say goodbye to your family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or we'll give you that special moment, and yes. we'll talk about your departure. Oh <laughs> no, you could have definitely told this story in a sort of um, oh, uh, what kind of a Running Man slash you know RoboCop um, uh-huh. kind of universe? Like RoboCop always had that. I'll buy that for a dollar. You know, those commercials. Yeah, no, and no. Stuff. You need to ratchet this up to eleven. Take yeah. the concept and make it even more absurd. Mm-hmm. Um. Because that's the thing. This movie did try at times to be funny, but it didn't land quite right because it was never clear what the, we were watching. Right. No, no. I would love to see this done and with that tongue firmly in cheek. Yes. Through it. Yeah. So we'll re, uh, at the end of this show, we'll report to the writer's room and we'll start. Uh, <laughs> we'll start hammering this one out. That's right. So did you find any critics from 2010 that uh, watched this film? I did, and uh, I, as I alluded to before we started recording, um, there was some interesting slants. Like, finding critiques wasn't hard, but finding critics that actually critiqued anything was. And everyone was enamored with Forrest Whitaker having dropped some weight. Everybody, everybody, everybody mentioned it. Oh my god! I like really. <laughs> that's that's what you got from this. That it would it was front and center on way too many th- things, so it was bizarre. But going down the line, as usual, top down. Uh, Miami Herald, Renee Rodriguez. Um, I got a snippet. Uh, this sci-fi thriller, Repo Men gets off to a sluggish start, but wait, you have to give the movie time to find its groove and establish its premise. Again, not a critique, really, just kind of an observation. Right. Well, that was at least sounds like, check it out. <laughs> yes, no, it was, that was in the category of, yes, this was probably still a fun film worth going to see. Um, New York Times, Stephen Holden, it may have been a shrewd business decision by the film's directors, Miguel Sapochnik, I'm going to butcher that, but my apologies, to treat the story as a nasty comic thriller. But when, after a certain point, Repo Men subsumes its satire to strenuous action sequences, it loses its edge and turns into a chase movie of no special distinction. Yeah, I think I kind of agree. Yeah. Now we'll slide in a little <laughs> more. Uh, USA Today, Claudia Puig. Sitting through this movie is worse than being locked in a room with a continuous loop of Nip Tuck playing <laughs> on a jumbo screen. <laughs> Wondering how she feels. Uh, I feel like she's... <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna need, she's got more to say. Gonna need more from that. Flesh that out for me. <laughs> Flesh it out. Ah. <laughs> and then finally, I got from the New York Post, Lou Luminick. 
Though he seems, referring to uh, Jude Law, ref, though he seems to be enjoying himself, this cable fodder is quite a come down from former Oscar nominee Law, Cold Mountain, and the t- talented Mr. Ripley, whose last foray into sci fi was AI, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. It doesn't exactly enhance the resumes of. Oscar winner Whitaker, the last king of Scotland, seen last week in the equally abysmal Our Family Wedding. So picking on (laughs) other films to get it for us. Um, Repo Men is a rare film where Toronto plays itself. It's also the first I've ever seen where a typewriter is used as a lethal weapon. (laughs) That was that uh, one of those moments that you were talking about that kind of it went for a little bit of a comedy yeah, well, especially since he literally used that typewriter to hammer out uh, Repossession Men, or Mo- Repossession Mambo, which we find out later, but that, <laughs> the fact that that typewriter was used to kill a man was a little more tongue-in-cheek than, it, it probably needed more of that, yeah. not less. Pens, the pen's mightier than the sword, the typewriter's mightier than the uh, than the gun, I guess. I guess so, uh, but uh, and it pains me. I actually did find a review on uh, Roger Ebert's website. This would have been after he passed, I believe. Um, but at any rate, uh, the writer in this just synopsized the movie. Oh, actually, it is Roger. I can't believe I'm missing that. Yeah, Roger just did a synopsis of the movie and and picked on the universal healthcare notion. Um, but other than that he doesn't actually say whether he likes it or not but he gave it two stars okay yeah usually i think if he just goes he's trying to if he's describing the film i think he's trying to like see how absurd this is by what you know what i'm describing to you two stars yeah exactly Uh, at one point he even asks the uh readers a question where he his response is i don't know (laughs) yeah. <laughs> like, so he's basically I he doesn't know how to feel about it. He gave it two stars and moved on with his life. Yeah. No, I, I think that's the, the, the sign of a film he didn't enjoy. He's not gonna sit there and say this is terrible, this is awful, I hated this film. He's just gonna say, Look how ridiculous this is. I'm telling you these things. This happened in this movie. Yes. That's all I need to say. Two stars. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that'll do it for that. Did we get anything anything at all out of social media? No, I'm afraid we did not. Come on, folks. Yeah, a little disappointing. I thought someone might have uh, picked this one up. I was waiting to find out that this was somebody's favorite. You know, this is just <laughs> the, the type of film that out of, out of nowhere, someone would go, oh my God, I love this film. But I don't think it, it just didn't go far enough in any direction. No. Uh, it, no, it, it was occasionally kind of gory, but not gory enough. Yeah. It was occasionally kind of uh, satirical, but not enough. Yeah. I, I, I think that's this film's problem is it just, it wasn't enough in, that's just it. That's, that's my review of the film. It's not enough. Well, yeah. I mean, it even brought in a metaphysical component to it. Um, but that didn't go anywhere. No, it, it wasn't <laughs> enough. <laughs> no. No. And maybe that's it. And that's why we're not getting it and why it didn't do particularly well is because it just didn't land. And I could, as much as I remember this and still can kind of enjoy watching some of it, mostly for the performances, I can see how for a lot of people this is in one ear out the other. Yeah. No, I could see myself in a week from now saying yeah i watched it um i can't remember much about it no <laughs> so run out and see repo <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah that's that's gonna do it for repo men uh we'll be back in two weeks and when we do we're gonna jump ahead a few years in release and a few years in the future we're gonna look at the 2014 remake of robocop which takes place in the future year of 2028. Woohoo! Almost there. Yeah. Again, first time watch for me for sure. I know I've not watched this one. No, uh, this one I did see in theater and uh, watched it 
at least once or twice after. Excellent. Yeah. When you start getting into the, 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 the 20 teens or whatever, I just, I had a kid, I had a house, <laughs> I did not have the liquid cash to go see things in the theaters. <laughs> and you were still making your way through the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. All right, yeah, that'll be a good time. Anyone has any comments on 2014's RoboCop, please send them our way. Or if you maybe missed the fact that we were going to watch Repo Man and you're listening to this and going, oh, I remember that film, write us. Let us know what you thought. Timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or follow the link in the show notes to all our social media sites, and including our Discord server, and you can come and uh, leave your thoughts there. That's going to do it, Tom. Thanks very much. Sure. We'll talk to everyone next time. Bye, everyone. See ya.